Um, hello. <clears throat> Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Amrit Klein, as uh, Alison kindly uh, said, and Pilar, of course. Um, I, uh, for the Vitra Design Museum, um, I co-curated this exhibition together with Alison Clark uh, from the Victor J. Popanek Foundation, and um, I'm excited to have all of you here. So, um, how is... How is this man relevant today? Um, how is it? How is he uh, relevant for today's design? In you know, in a city that hosts events like this and a museum that not only co-hosts or co-organizes this, but uh, organizes exhibitions like this one. So how can we make this um, a relevant exhibition for today? Um, <clears throat> you know, beyond uh, a, a historical reference, which is of course important to really ground this in history, but how can we make it relevant to today? So, um, I would like to start with a rant. <laughs> Sorry, I hope you will bear with me. There are a few things that are deeply inherently wrong with social design today. One of them being this. Now. Don't get me wrong, I like uh, happy children, like most people. Um, I, I am happy with them. Now, what I do not like is when pictures of smiling children, preferably of color, are uh, being used with no caption or explanation as a proof of project success. Um, this is something that we find very frequently in social design. And the problem that I have with this is that um, these children um, are being used as objects rather than individuals and subjects. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is a huge problem. This is something that we see again and again. Um, another thing, and I'm just quoting, of, I'm just naming a few of the problems in no particular order, but this is another problem that I really have. Why am I so critical about things like this? Um, because, you know, basically what this suggests, it says, this is great, it's recycled. But ultimately it says, go ahead, no problem, shop on. It's great, it's recycled. Don't bother to change your behavior, everything's fine. Don't, for Christ's sake, stop shopping. Well, that's a problem. We will have to change our consumer behavior. Otherwise, you know, things might end not so well for us. Um, another thing that I am really critical of is simple solutions. You know, most of the problem that we face are very, very, very complex. And when I see things like this, this is the Ocean Cleanup Project, founded by a Dutch, uh, then 18-year-old Dutch Boyan Slaat in 2013. And basically, to cut the long story short, this young man ventured out with a kind of a fishing net technology to clean up the ocean's plastic waste all by himself. Go ahead. Uh, you know, if it was that simple, maybe we wouldn't be in the, prob in, the, in the situation to begin with. And there are many biologists and other experts who are very critical of this project. And at the moment, it's also at a pause. It's halted because they are facing um, problems. So um, this and many other um, problems are based on one... Um, major issue that I am even more, most angry about, good intentions. Good intentions are just not good enough. This is a man that I'm uh, a big fan of. Uh, it's a social philosopher, Ivan Illich, and like Papanek, he was uh, an Austrian um, and became an American. Um, and in April 68, he gave a speech to a group of American students uh, who were en route uh, to uh, volunteer in Mexico. And in this speech he said, to hell with good intentions. If you insist on working with the poor, if this is your vocation, then at least 
work among the poor who can tell you to go to hell. And I deeply, deeply support this. Please do not go to Africa to save the world, really. There are lots of Africans who are very good designers, architects, engineers, politicians, whatever, who can do that. They don't need you, they don't need us. And instead of adding depth and rigor uh, to the study of a nascent field with tremendous potential, the naivety, the poor research, and the uncriticality perpetuates stereotypes and contributes to the belief that good intentions, and I'm putting them under unquote, um, are enough, and reinforcing, uh, thus reinforcing narratives with a strong neocolonial undercurrent. And I think this is highly problematic. Uh, while, you know, social design has to be about much, much more than good intentions. It's political, it's complex, it's not easily digestible uh, in, you know, feel-good blurbs. It's not good enough. This is not good enough. It deserves critical analysis and rigorous evaluation, and social design deserves much better than just, you know, celebrating the world as uh, celebrating design as, as making uh, the world a better place. So instead of, of naively doing this, um, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't show you even Illich. This is him. <laughs> so instead of doing this, um, we selected, very carefully selected, a very uh, small uh, uh, choice of contemporary works, um, very carefully, um, that rather than presenting solutions, questions, dead certainties that we have about design, social design in particular, um, and, and, and really challenging, challenges our notions of what we should be doing when we talk about uh, social design. Um, so I'm going to take you through a few of these objects that you will find in the exhibition. Um, this is, by the way, a shot of uh, the installation in Wall am Rhein. It looks a lot better here, let me tell you. Mark, my director, he didn't hear that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to present some of the pieces and please, uh, I would love you to, to investigate deeper and further in the exhibition. This is a project that's called Normal by a uh, South African called um, Mark Henning who went to study in Eindhoven, Eindhoven Design Academy. And so as an immigrant, the first thing that he encountered was administration, you know, filling in papers and trying to settle his immigration status. Um, and he met all these civil servants in all these, you know, uh, places, uh, realizing that there was this tiny awkward moment in the very beginning of the interaction when you shake hands. And so he made this whole project about how um, you know, we consider something to be normal uh, uh, on the example of the handshake. And so he has this table of, uh, you know, lines that, so you can, you can, uh, you can, your arm has to reach out all uh, according to this line and, and there's this very uh, uh, stylized, um, um, uh, formalized act of how you normally shake hands in the Netherlands. Um, really questioning um, what is, what we consider as normal. Because it's, you know, it, it sounds almost a little bit ridiculous, and yes, he's trying to poke fun of it. But on the other hand, we all know this, you know, awkward moment sometimes when we meet someone and they don't behave the way we expect them to behave. And so this what is normal is really something that uh, Viktor Papanek was also concerned with. You know, he, was, he really uh, spoke about how design tends to um, uh, service and cater to an average, but the average usually is white, male, middle-aged, and, and, and European or North American, um, while most of us in the world are not. Uh, and so what's normal? This is a very important question that we have to ask. Um, and even when we design for a so-called minority, how can we design without, you know, how can we include one group without excluding the other? 
So this is, um, so I, I, I keep uh, being asked, so what is there that, is there something that is really, really well known that Papanek designed? Um, you know the uh, original, I, I'm sure you all know the original international symbol for accessibility, um, which was developed in a workshop and a seminar by a student of Viktor Papanek. Um, now this is a project, a contemporary project that takes the very static figure that we all know, makes it, turns it into something more dynamic and more empowered. And at the same time, it does open the question, you know, there are so many disabilities. Why on earth would we choose a wheelchair to symbolize every disability? And here, just in this room over there, um, there's a very nice, uh, graphic design of an icon from the Paralympics in 1992, Petra, and uh, it's a figure with no arms, and I find that very interesting. So, you know, who, who do we design for? Can we design inclusively without excluding at the same time? Um, this is um, a design, a piece that is called, and the design is actually the box with the red dot, and you will find it in the exhibition. It looks a little different, uh, the model changed. Um, it's called Mosquito, and officially uh, the producer uh, names it uh, anti-loitering device. Now, um, this is a design, and we placed this in, in, in the context of design for children and design for young, for young people. Um, this is made, this, uh, is a box that you can uh, place on a wall and it will emit a very high-pitched noise and biology wants it that as we grow older we hear less and less, especially high-pitched sounds. Um, and so this is a very unpleasant sound that can only be heard if you're a child or a very young person. So it will, um, it will you know, create a very unpleasant feeling for you and you will not want to hang out there, while if, you're an, if you are like my age, you don't even hear this. So, um, the question that we, would like, that we wanted to bring up with presenting this piece is, who do we actually design for? Yes, this is designed for young adults or teenagers, but obviously it's not for them, but against them. So, and this is especially true if you look at design for children. If you look at playgrounds, often you'd have to ask yourself, so is this really the best we can do to spark imagination, to convey a feeling of adventure? Is this really the best playground that we can come up with for a child? Or is it rather responding to parents' needs of, you know, safety and, 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 and you know, control? And I think, um, again, this is something that many designers don't ask themselves. This is um, a tote bag that we placed in a, the context of design for um, the global cultures. Um, so this uh, will be, uh, this, you will find this next to Viktor Papanek's um, Tin Can Radio. Um, as I mentioned before, social design tends often tends to be very, very patronizing. And Viktor Papanek was criticized for being patronizing. Um, although he did correct that, and he did, uh, in the second edition of Design for the Real World, he did write a long introduction, um, really changing this perspective and, and, and uh, shedding a new light on this. Um, so this tote bag, the text on it says, um, this text has no other purpose than to frighten those who are afraid of their Arabic language. And it's true. The Arabic script, it's thousands of years old. It's, a th it's thousands of years of culture uh, uh, and, and, and history um, is disappearing from the public space because we associate Islamic what? Um, and this is a design couple that uh, is Palestinian living in Israel, and in Israel it's, it's even more the case. Arabic script has basically vanished from the public space. And what we're trying to say here is, people can talk for themselves. Really, they don't need us to talk for them. Everybody 
go to hell, you know, <laughs> with good intentions. If you want to save the world, please save it in a place where people can go tell you to go to hell and uh, speak your language. Um, so, um, there's one area in this exhibition, you, uh, everything is juxtaposed with historical material, except for one area. Um, and we found that, um, Alison mentioned it, <laughs> uh, Papanek and women was somewhat critical. Uh, while he did talk about women as minorities that should be, you know, um, should deserve more attention by design, we didn't find much evidence of himself um, really being very active in this regard. Um, but of course, how can you do a show uh, that's subtitled The Politics of Design in 2019? Uh, that does not speak about gender balance and gender politics and gender identity. And so we do have an entire area with no historical reference, just contemporary pieces um, that speak about this issue. And this is um, the Autocomplete Truth, a uh, campaign by UN Women. And um, they did something really simple. They entered uh, four you, you, are you all uh, familiar with the autocomplete function of, of, of Google? So you enter something in your Google search and then Google proposes something. And the proposal is based on simple algorithms. It's ultimately, um, it, it reacts to like, um, it's fed by six billion searches daily. Um, and, and then uh, the, the, the uh, words and notions and word combinations that are searched for most come up by this algorithm. It's very simple. Um, and so they entered women should, women shouldn't, women need to, and women cannot. And what comes up is women cannot drive, women shouldn't vote, women should stay at home, uh, women need to be disciplined, etc. cetera. Um, shedding light to gender bias and inequality um, that is really striking and I think needs no further comment. And again, this is not magic, this is not fiction, it's just a simple algorithm. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces in the exhibition, the Nike Pro Hijab. So, um, what's really important for us is we don't want to impose any opinion onto the visitor. We believe that visitors are clever enough to have their own opinions. So we present this um, uh, purposefully objective, if, you, if I may say so. Um, the Nike hijab is a modest sportswear item that allows women who want to cover their hair uh, while exercising um, to do so uh, with a high-tech sports material that you know soaks up and dries quickly and whatnot. Um, now, you could argue, or we could argue, this is great because it allows women who were previously excluded from a public activity, it allows them to now uh, participate in this public activity, which is sports, without betraying their religious beliefs. Um, on the other side, we could also argue, no, we, this is not great because the hijab in and by itself is something that contradicts the values of our Western societies. But that's not the point. We don't want to talk about whether it's good or not good, but we want to talk about what is actually good and what is better. Often design and social design uh, seeks to make the world a better place, but better for who? Who, did, who decides what is better? What, what do we actually mean by better? And I think this is something, again, that many designers and many people are not aware of. If, if, if we talk about better from a perspective of us, you know, EU members, we all have European passports, we have fairly uh, light skin and light hair and, 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 and light eyes. Well, that is a very limited perspective of what's better in the world. And we're really trying to, to bring up this, this um, very limited notion and this uh, um, preconception. This is a piece that someone who sits in the audience suggested to me. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Uh, it's a piece of DIY uh, Brazilian design um, 
uh, developed by a design collective in 2014 when the worst water crisis ever hit uh, Sao Paulo, which is the world's seventh largest metropolitan area with 20 million inhabitants. Um, it's a water pump that you can easily build with very cheap materials and that basically um, feeds your gray water, that is water that um, after washing your hands, for example, into a circular system in your house uh, so you can shower and then the water that you used for the shower will then uh, be used to flush your toilet, etc., to save uh, water. Now, this was quite uh, successful in the water crisis, but bang, once the crisis was over, people forgot about it. So how far are we actually prepared to really go? You know, are we really willing to uh, pursue things that are ideas uh, if, if we're not in deep need? Um, it's also a very, uh, yeah, sad, <laughs> sad moment <laughs> when, when we have to admit that ultimately if we're not struck by crisis that very moment, we don't care that much. Um, and this is another uh, example of, of, uh, that you will find that addresses another really striking thing. So Thomas Twaits, um, as a final project for his uh, design studies at the Royal College of Art in London, um, decided to make a toaster from scratch. Now there's this naive and romantic idea of, of DIY, of making things yourself, and fair enough, it is a very good way of appropriating objects for yourself. It's a very good way of self-empowerment to make things and to, you know, by making something yourself, you really take, you, you take a step uh, out uh, of a global capitalist um, system, if you want. It's, 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 a, it's a very subtle way of, of protest in one way. In another way, it's really, as I said, romanticizing. So Thomas Twaits tried to do a toaster. He tried to make a toaster. And what he did is, he, what he started with is, he bought the cheapest toaster that he could find that cost three pounds 99. He disassembled that toaster and found out that it's made of more than, it consists of more than 400 parts um, made of more than 100 materials. So, one, he decided he cannot do, he, he can't pull off 100 materials, so he, he reduced to five, and then he really set out to make this toaster with five materials. And a year later, he had spent more than 1,000 pounds. The image to the right is what the toaster looked like, and that's what the toaster looked like after he set it to function. So it lasted maybe one second. Um, so how is it possible that a pristine, perfect product costs three pounds 99 if so much resource goes into it? Who pays the price? And this is really something that is essential to what Viktor Papanek says. Design is much more than just the final product. Where does this come from and where does it go? Who pays the price and what type of price along this whole journey of you know, retrieving a material uh, until eventually nothing, hopefully, is left of, of, of what we have, or maybe it is left and has a, pi a, a price to pay in 100 years until finally the plastic will be disassembled, hopefully, or maybe not. Um, so who pays the price? Is it you know, a Chinese worker? Is it a child in some copper mine somewhere in Africa? the environment, most certainly, etc. And this is really important uh, if you want to understand um, Viktor Papanek. Everything is a system. That's what he says, ultimately. And this is a beautiful piece that's in the exhibition um, um, by Thomas Saraceno. Everything is connected. And what's most interesting, there is, you know, coming every, uh, ideas, solutions, suggestions, coming from different backgrounds, different, uh, different directions, and different disciplines. And at the center, where the knot is, that's the most interesting place. And this is where the designer is. 
the designer who communicates and translates for all these disciplines. And that's one of my favorite quotes from Viktor Papanek, ultimately design is communication. And I think he's really right. Um, and so we look at how design is used in this regard with, for example, forensic architecture, a design research group um, that is based in London at Goldsmith University uses um, tools and techniques and perspectives from architecture and design, uh, but also filmmaking, uh, social media design, etc., to investigate in human rights violations, such as um, the bomb cloud atlas that you will find in the exhibition. Um, or we also look at, again, you know, consumer culture and, con and consumption in, in general and the commodification of basically anything, including citizenship, with this game uh, that I would like to invite you to play in the exhibition. So you enter your name and you will receive um, an identity and, an, and a nationality randomly and a budget. And from there, you are asked to change your nationality because other than what we might think, nationality has also become a, com a commodity and you can go and buy any nationality, including EU nationalities, as I'm sure you're aware of. We talk about the protection uh, or not of environment, of our environment. This is a collection of perfumes that um, uh, allow us to smell things that will vanish if climate change and climate crisis goes on as it does currently. Uh, for example, honey, because bees will die, we won't have wine, uh, we coasts, coast uh, smells really nicely. You, you can smell the perfumes in the exhibition. It smells of um, tan screen and, and how do you call it? Like, uh, yeah, like sunscreen and, and uh, also sea and algae. It's a very nice smell. Um, this is, um, again, a project that um, speaks about the destruction of environment. It's a Mexican designer who, um, uh, um, it's, it's about heirloom corn. So he ventures out to um, regain or to maybe save, that's, that's a big word, heirloom corn, which is um, basically in extinction in Mexico because of imported, since the NAFTA, the Americans are allowed to import genetically modified corn, which cross pollinates with all the heirloom corn and basically destroys it. Um, and so what he does is he, he does not only uh, come up with a new product that is made of the husk of different types of heirloom corn, but what's really interesting about this project is that the way how he, he connects people, so he connects the farmers, he connects um, uh, women in villages who do the veneer, uh, he connects chefs, Mexican chefs who are also worried about you know, the loss of, of heirloom corn for the uh, Mexican cuisine. He connects with a huge data, um, a seed data bank in Mexico City for corn, etc. So what's really interesting is this role, again, as a communicator and as a networker rather than, than anything else. Um, and finally, we speak about how biotechnology um, also uh, challenges our perception of what uh, design is and what we can design and by, with what effect. Um, this is a project where Daisy Ginsburg suggests uh, microorganisms to, you know, s save us from or to help uh, overcome uh, effects from, from climate change and from extinction because currently we're in the sixth extinction. Every 20 minutes a species dies in the world um, and she proposes, this is speculative of course, she proposes to design organisms that will replace those who have died and uh, fulfill their role, but at the same time uh, maybe do something against the source of the, uh, you know, the waste and the, the reason why these organisms died in the first place, but then that's us. So there's a lot of questions that come up. Um, and finally, and I'm coming to a, an end here, um, since all of this is a little bit depressing, almost, um, we felt that we really needed a positive 
note uh, for the end of the exhibition. This is the Antarctica flag uh, by Lucien Jorge Otter. Now, the Antarctica is the only place in the world that does not belong to anybody or belongs to all of us. It's a bit ironic that it's such a hostile place, but then it's also kind of an, a utopia, and so they they, um, the flag is just a part of a bigger project. They, uh, they designed an entire settlement with tents for all of us and with a flag that consists of all these different flags. And this is really um, a message to all of us that if you want to solve any of the problems that we talk about in the exhibition, every single one, they're all complex, they're all huge and impossible to solve with simple solutions. And if we want to do anything about this, we have to understand and we have to tackle this as humanity, all of us together. And we cannot by, you know, splitting up and going against each other because otherwise, potentially, um, we will be closer to the end than we might want to. Thank you so much. <laughs>